Hello everyone. JavaScriptum Blitz is here and it's me and my colleague from the France Port Asia. Let's start from the beginning. Let me just describe who we are and what are we doing here. So France Port Asia is a group of active front-end developers and activists in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So we are located in the Central Asia. That's why we do call ourselves France Port Asia. We have about six community drivers. We have uh, more than, uh, right now, actually, we have already more than 3,000 community members. And we do have more than 200 Telegram subscribers. Actually, we are not, maybe we are not the biggest community in the Central Asia, but we are one of the big ones. And in our local area, we are doing a lot of different meetups, meetings, workshops, tech talks, et cetera, et cetera. And one of our formats that we would like to share with you today is JavaScriptum. JavaScriptum is a meetup where we are collecting together and just sharing some technical talks, which will be interesting to hear and listen uh, for the developers with any level of competency. And but today, as you may see, we called our JavaScriptum as JavaScriptum Blitz. And actually, also, I am talking a little faster than, you know, uh, I should probably. Why? Because we, are, we don't have a lot of time. And in Blitz format, we have only 30 minutes for every talk. So I will not bother you anymore. Uh, let me just show you. Let me just remind you that you shouldn't forget to say thank you if you will like some presentation and some tech talk. And please do not forget to follow us on the social media. I think if you will be watching it on the YouTube, you can just put it on the pause and just scan these QR codes just to follow the front spot Asia. And welcome to the JavaScript, the JavaScript on Blitz. Uh, right now, I will be inviting to the stage our first speaker, and it's going to be Dmitry Christofariti, who is going to be talking about the healthy web and core web vitals. Hello, everyone. Today, we will talk about how to make your website healthier with the help of core web vitals. Uh, first of all, my name is Dmitry and I have been working as a software engineer at EPUMP system for the last two years. Uh, surprisingly, my path to IT began with game developer five years ago, but times are changing and I've been working as a front-end developer for the last three plus years. So let's run quickly through the presentation's agenda. At the beginning, I will share with you some numbers and uh, tell you what Core Web Vitals is in general. Then we will look more detail at the main three metrics, LCP, FID, and CLS. And at the end of presentation, I will tell you about the tool that I used. So the numbers. Uh, even though it's important that your site works quickly and be responsive, but only 40% of the analyzed sites have passed the core of vitals. The first five seconds of loading your site are more important for the conversion. And if it does not loading during this time, then every next second will cost you about 4.5% and user will simply leave your website. And the scary statistics is that on average, mobile devices, uh, mobile websites are loading in 15 seconds. Doesn't sound particularly good, right? Uh, let us find out how to avoid such statistics. So, Core Web Vitals. What is it and why was it invented? Uh, first, it's worth saying that Core Web Vitals is a set of metrics for evaluating the performance of your website. Uh, which Google presented to the public in 2020. Uh, we can all go to the website and see whether it suits us or not, whether it's lost for a long time or, sh or quickly, and whether it's stable. But all of this will be an abstract and subjective assessment, just to give an accurate assessment with indicators and figures, core web vitals measures were weighted. So the main three metrics included in the set are LCP, FID, and CLS. Each of them is responsible for its own performance attribute. 
LCP is responsible for the speed of loading, FAD is the speed of interactivity, and CLS is for visual stability. Uh, let us look to the, each of them closely. Uh, LCP stands for Largest Contentful Paint, and uh, it displays the time uh, of which, uh, for which the user will see the largest element of the page. This element can be anything. It can be a picture or video or text. Uh, a good indicator is 2.5 seconds. It means that no more than 2.5 seconds should pass from the moment the user click on the link to your website to the moment when he can he or she can see the main element. If more time passes, then you need to think about the improving. And if uh, this time is more than four seconds, it means that everything is pretty bad. Of course, the reason for the long loading of the page may be users weak internet connection and you can influence it but there are points that you should pay attention to so first of all it's server long server response you need to assess uh, the load that will go to your server and choose the appropriate parameter parameter for your server as ram or ssd and so on also, JS and CSS resources may slow down the rendering of the page, so you should pay attention to them as well. Choose good uh, third-party services, uh, or otherwise your site may slow down through someone else's fault. And also try to take a part of the page rendering to the service site, so the HTML will load faster. Uh, let us talk about the um, methods to improve this indicator. Uh, firstly, for important files, you can specify the attribute rel equal preload. For uh, this attribute will help you to load your resources in advance. And also for images, you can use the priority fetch priority attribute and set high for the highest priority images and low for the lowest to not uh, load the low priority images at the beginning of the render. Also, uh, for um, uh, to, you can you need to put uh, JS as much as possible at the end of the load of the loading and rendering. Uh, the more critical of JS, you need to highlight in the script tag, and you can put it in body. But less priority, you can uh, connect through the JS uh, file and using defer attribute to load it at the end of the rendering. As for styles, uh, put the most important style in the style tag at the head of your HTML. It, uh, in this way, it will be applied faster. And some more important uh, points. Uh, compress images. You need to compress it in about 30 kilobytes or less. Also, you need to use modern images, uh, modern uh, images formats as WebP or GFIF. Also, you can use the compressed font formats as WOF and WOF2 and learn SSR. It will help you to improve your HTML rendering. The next metric is FID or first input delay. This metric displays the time that will pass from the moment the element displayed in the interface to the moment when user can interact with it. For example, as soon as the user sees the button, uh, it must be functional after 100 milliseconds. Otherwise, it may happen that user click on the button and nothing happens. It pisses us off to the press the button several times in a row. Uh, a delay in an activity may occur due to long-term tasks. Uh, so uh, the button is in the front of the user, but the execution of the JavaScript file, a large JavaScript file, has not yet reached the code where, with the functionality of this button. Uh, also, just the large size of JS can also affect this speed. In, if the functionality is associated with local storage and it's large, then passing through it can also slow down the process of interaction. And an important factor is third-party resources uh, take their loading to the background. As I said earlier, one big JS file is not the best solution, so you need to divide the functionality by files and bundles and give them priorities. So you will uh, download the necessary data earlier and the unnecessary ones will wait. Uh, some crucial functions should be if uh, should be included in the HTML document, so you will be 100% sure that their implementation will not be delayed. 
but uh, do not overuse it too much. JS uh, code in the HTML or too much separation can play in the different position direction. Uh, also, important points: use dynamic import and split the large components into chunks. The next metric is cumulative layout shift. This metric metric is kind of different from the previous two since uh, it's not related to the time, but it's associated with an expected shift in the interface, which can disorient user and uh, uh, can lead to incorrect decision. So uh, here is an example of not clean situation. I've added an item to the shopping cart. Uh, for purchase, but notice that the quantity was too large and I want to return it back. But uh, unexpectedly for me, when I click on the back button, a banner appears on the top and shift all the content. Because of this, I press the wrong button and place the wrong order. Now, at the best, uh, I need to write to support and somehow deal with it. And at the worst, I need to kind of return my money somehow. So all of this can happen due to uh, images without dimensions. Uh, they can shift the content unexpectedly when it fully load. Uh, also, advertising banners uh, that have not been allocated uh, a place or have uh, or have not been put in a stop in advance. Uh, dynamically added content by itself also can um, uh, be the reason of poor COS. Uh, because uh, you need to add content only based on user actions, uh, then it will be more expected. And also fonts can also affect the block sites if the font is loading for a long time. So to avoid such problems, you can set the dimensions, uh, dimensions for the image uh, even before it loaded. So you can set width and height, and uh, actually you need to set them uh, based on the image itself. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, set a stop or set a mean height, um, mean height style for the ads to uh, reserve the space for them when they will load. Uh, also, uh, using CSS properties for animation can be tricky. Using them, you can shift parent and neighbor elements. If this is not what you expect, then use the transform uh, property instead of using height or something like that. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to share with you uh, tools for working with these metrics. Uh, first, it's uh, page speech page speed insight and lighthouse uh, they are pretty similar functionality and these uh, site analyzers can show you the weaknesses and the tips for solving the problem with uh, performance also dev tool performance is a tab on the dev tool panel in chrome browser and this is more for developers which graphically show you all the stage of loading of your page and uh, uh, which can help you to identify some problems Problems. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. And you can ask more questions to my LinkedIn if you want. And that's all. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dmitry. It was a very interesting presentation. And before moving forward, I would like to say that if you have any kind of questions, please do not hesitate to ask them in the comments section. And we will not have any kind of dedicated uh, section with questions and answers right now, but we will try to reach you and answer your questions in the comments section as well. But if you have any kind of personal questions to Dmitry, please follow the link, use and contact him directly. Thank you, Dmitry, again. And let's move forward. Our next presentation is going to be about the uh, JavaScript date. And actually, all of us knows that it's really kind of pain to work with the JavaScript date right now. And Mehmet is going to show us the new hope for it. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the JavaScript date. And there is a new proposal about handling dates and times in JavaScript. And it is called uh, Temporal. 
Uh, and but uh, it is not available at the moment, and there is a, a workaround called JS Yoda, and I'm going to talk about all that. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself to you. I've been a senior software engineer at IPAM for uh, more than two years. And as a whole, I've been working as a full-stack JavaScript developer uh, more than five years. And currently, uh, I'm entertaining myself with uh, micro frontends, internationalization, web accessibility, and web security nowadays. Before getting into all that, let's remember what JavaScript data is. Uh, it is time in milliseconds since epoch, which means that at midnight on January 1st, 1970 UTC. So JavaScript date actually counts milliseconds uh, by ticks, tick, 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 by milliseconds. And it uniquely defines an instant in history, uh, which we call it as a timestamp. But Weirdly, it was written in a 10 days window as a part of uh, as a part of Java Util date library, which was deprecated in 1997, uh, which makes it uh, 26 years old. So, folks, we are all using very old library here, and it brings us uh, many problems. And let's talk about those right now. First of all, JavaScript date is mutable which means that you can create a date, you can do some alterations, but you can, uh, you, you can never predict what will be the result after the mutation. So it has some unintended side effects. And it can be really cumbersome and hard to trace to find uh, and fix bugs related to those. It also has very unpredictable daylight say uh, daylight saving time behavior and can cause problems during transitions. What I mean by that, for example, some countries, uh, they prefer to use the daylight uh, saving time. Let's take uh, UK, for example, at certain times uh, of the year, they switch to plus one and uh, at another time, they switch back to UTC zero, right? So uh, JavaScript is not capable of hand handling these transitions. So it can cause problems for UK students, for example. And uh, it has no built-in support for date and time operations. You know, we want to uh, subtract dates. Uh, we want to learn what is the amount of time between two days or between two timestamps, right? And for that, we rely on uh, Third-party libraries such as DataFNS, Lexin, and Moment are the most uh, like uh, famous of all. And uh, by chance, if you are using Moment in 20 to, uh, 2023, please stop using it. Uh, it's already deprecated and um, is uh, mutable, and it already possesses the problems that the JavaScript date has. So if you're using Moment, please, uh, please stop using it. And most famous problems, uh, most famous problem of JavaScript date is called uh, off one by day. Uh, if you have come across this stack overflow um, question, is the JavaScript date object always one day off? No, it is not. But JavaScript date has poor capability of handling time zones. Basically, it has support uh, for two time zones. One is UTC, which is what we count uh, towards uh, in, in time. Uh, and we, that time is reflected on the user's computer as a local time. There is no other support for other time zones. And it has a very unreliable parser behavior. What I mean by that? If you create a date with the constructor or, or with the parse function, it accepts uh, a string, right? And that you can pass uh, like any kind of string into that. Uh, if you are passing invalid uh, string, it will return you invalid date. But there are formats that supports, uh, originally it supports ISO 8601 format. Um, and the, it also supports non-ISO formats. So when it, 
uh, comes to parsing, uh, there are two different distinctions, like uh, date only forms and date time forms. Date only forms, which is like YYYMMDD or YYYMM or YYY. So these date only forms are interpreted as UTC time. And other than that, if we are passing this uh, ISO um, 8601 string, it is also like a UTC time. But if you are not passing a Zulu time, uh, which represents the uh, zero uh, time zone, it uh, interprets as, as a local time. So you, you, you never, ex uh, you, can, you cannot rely on this uh, parser behavior. And here is another uh, one day off issue. Uh, it is from the React uh, date picker library. And uh, as you can see, it, it was open in 1917 uh, and it was not resolved to this day. So what do we want? Like, uh, should we like delete JavaScript from the ecosystem? No, we cannot. Because uh, there are millions of users of it and there will be people using it uh, maybe 50 years later. You cannot guarantee. So we cannot really deprecate it or delete it. Because it will break the web. So what we want, we want a new date time API, which, uh, which should be consist of immutable objects. And to eliminate the side effects, it should be predictable, testable, and reliable. It should support time zones and daylight saving transitions, as I mentioned earlier. It should account for leap seconds and years, and that's uh, most related to the how uh, UTC is uh, accounted for, how atomic clock is accounted for. Uh, JavaScript doesn't account for leap seconds and leap years at all. And it should work with different calendar systems. Uh, JavaScript date only works with the Gregorian calendar, but we also need support for other calendar systems like Hebrew, Islamic, and so on. And most of all, we need a built-in time support for date-time operations. We should be able to calculate uh, to the difference between two dates, right? We shouldn't rely on third-party libraries for that. Yeah, uh, the solution is temporal RFC. Uh, I will be sharing the link. And as I mentioned, it provides uh, uh, immutable objects. But these immutable objects categorized as uh, two, dif uh, two different parts. Uh, one is the wall clock times, and the second is exact times. What do I mean by that? Wall clock times, uh, these are the dates and times that we don't need time zone information for. Like uh, when you look at the clock, for example, do you see any time zone? No. That's uh, what we call as clock, uh, wall clock time. Uh, if you can notice, uh, they have a, a prefix of plane, like because they don't uh, have any time zone information. For example, let's take plane date uh, as an example. Uh, so, what is your birthday? If I ask you, so you will tell me your uh, birthday as a date, right? Uh, like uh, 1980, February uh, 20, for example. So you don't need to present any time zone any information over there because irrelevant uh, to the question. But on the other hand, uh, you need to be sometimes specific uh, with the, uh, what time it is regarding the time zone. And there are two uh, objects for that, uh, which were provided by the temporal API. And one is instant, which is actually uh, what we know uh, as a JavaScript date. Like as we discussed, JavaScript date uh, is milliseconds uh, in time. And instant in temporal is milliseconds or nanoseconds uh, in time. Let's uh, have a look at this uh, picture to understand better. So we have a uh, full representation of any date time. 
uh, in temporal. Uh, we have plain month day when we need it. We can use year month. We can use plain date, plain time, plain date time. Uh, as you can see, instant has a Z suffix. It is same as JavaScript date. But in addition to instant representation, we can also represent the date time with the time zone and calendar extension. So it will be very useful, uh, this kind of information to store it in the uh, backend, for example. Let's dive into more details uh, and let's talk about the instant. So it represents the exact point in time. So it can measure, uh, it can be measured in milliseconds or nanoseconds. And it can be used for high precision timing, like uh, capturing sensor data. For example, you have an I IoT device and you want to record uh, some temperature with it. And you want, you really need the exact time for it. So you can create a time. Uh, you can create an instant from milliseconds or nanoseconds. Uh, as a reminder, JavaScript doesn't uh, have any support for uh, nanoseconds. So it will really uh, increase the granularity of your uh, time measurement. Let's talk about zone date time and it represents a date time in specific time zone. So it has robust support for time zones, handling daylight savings, and uh, you can convert uh, date and time between time zones easily. As an example, we can give a flight for that. Uh, for example, uh, you're going to take off from New York and you're going to land in London. So in order to give this information to the other side, other person, you need to talk in terms of time zone. Hey, I'm going to depart from New York um, at uh, this time and I'm going to arrive in London at this time. So if you, uh, if you can say we are using two different uh, time zones here. Another uh, temporal object is plain date. So it represents a date with a time zone information. So where, where can we use this one? For example, birthdays, anniversaries. Well, Tom uh, was born uh, in 1949, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, it's really simple. You just need a uh, date without time zone information. And plain uh, time is similar. Uh, it's a representation of uh, time of the day without uh, date or time zone. So what can be examples for this? Uh, for example, meetings, appointments. Uh, you can meet with your doctor at 3 p.m. or uh, you have a meeting with uh, some person uh, or you can have some subway departure at uh, another time. So you don't really need uh, date or time zone information. Uh, another new object that Temporal presents is duration. And it's, it's actually a duration of time, like in a period of seconds or minutes. For example, a video duration uh, or time remaining. The video duration is uh, two hours, 30 minutes and 45 seconds. And dinner, uh, until dinner uh, is complete, we have 15 minutes and 30 seconds. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the temporal is not ready for production yet. Currently is at stage three, which means that it's a candidate for the ECMAScript specification. The next steps will be uh, the start of migration, and once it's uh, approved, it will be the official uh, part of ECMAScript specification. In order to use Temporal in your projects, uh, you can simply install it. Uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, you shouldn't use it in production, but feel free to uh, experiment with it by installing this uh, JS Temporal polyfill. Here are the uh, some links uh, for the temporal. Here is the cookbook, and here is the GitHub page. Uh, I will stop a second if you want to take a photo.
So uh, in the meantime, what we can do, we don't want to use JavaScript date. And what we can do, uh, there is a production ready alternative to Temporal, which provides similar API uh, as Temporal. Uh, it is uh, written in domain. Uh, it is written with domain-driven design principles. It provides a simple and clean API. It is also uh, very fast. Uh, I'm saying this from the uh, my experience. It's robust and stable. Let's compare JSJoda and Temporal. Uh, JS Yoda and Temporal has uh, uh, similar uh, APIs, similar, they uh, provide similar objects. For example, let's uh, take year. Uh, it doesn't have any presentation in Temporal, but in Temporal you can get it easily. Uh, and you can see on the right that uh, it's the example, 2023. Month is September and year month. Uh, in Temporal, we have a uh, plane. Uh, prefix for that in JS Joda we don't uh, similar uh, for the month day and day of week is Thursday which doesn't have any presentation in temporal but this is the uh, better picture what uh, how they differ from each other uh, and these are the most common used uh, objects in both for example in JS Joda we have a local uh, prefix in temporal, we have a plain prefix, but they are actually uh, the same objects, let's, let's call it. And local time, as you can see, we have uh, nanoseconds granularity, and for local date time, uh, uh, it is similar. Zone date time, uh, this is same as instant. And what are the other uh, differences? Uh, we have zone ID and in temporal, we have time zone uh, for time zone representations. In JSGO, we don't have uh, any specific calendar system, but uh, in temporal, it provides Hebrew, Gregory, uh, Gregorian, and Islamic calendars in addition to the uh, ISO 8601. Uh, duration are the same and period, for example, uh, period of 10 years. Uh, I'm going to stop here uh, for for about uh, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, you can take a photo of these links if you want. Uh, and I would like to mention uh, what uh, they will give you. Uh, concept uh, breakdown is a day two article. And uh, it, uh, it gives you the information of what temporal is, uh, what are the uh, real use cases uh, in using that. Uh, it's a very great article. And another one is fixing an off day, uh, off by one day bug. It's a YouTube video. And you can understand in detail how JavaScript date works with the time zones. And uh, it is a bit uh, tense video, uh, maybe funny, but uh, the another video is problem with the time and time zones. Uh, I would like, uh, I would recommend you to uh, read and watch these. So thank you for your attention and may the temporal with you, folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Mehmet. Actually, it seems like we are really looking forward uh, to, yeah, we are really looking forward uh, for the temporal to be released and when we will be able to use it thanks a lot for all the alternatives that we already have right now um, before moving forward i will just to mention that you are sitting on the javascript to blitz and why do we call it blitz because all the technical talks that we are handling right now are only for 30 minutes why do we think that 30 minutes is a great uh, for sharing some information because we think that technical talks should be like door opener so and a little hook. So we are just opening the door for a new uh, technology for you and giving you some links. And by these links, you are continuing this journey by yourself. So yeah, 
uh, I'm happy to invite our last uh, our last speaker on the stage. It's Ekjan, and he will be opening the door into our future. He will be talking about the GitHub Copilot and the artificial intelligence. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm very glad uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, so can you see my screen now? Presentation. Yes, we do. Uh -huh. That's great. Okay, yeah, today I'm going to talk about improving our efficiency with GitHub Copilot X. Uh, my name is Akijan. I am currently a senior senior software engineer at EPAM. With, uh, I'm working at EPAM for one and a half year. And my primary tech stack is JavaScript, frontend, uh, and more specifically, React. And also, I'm gra I've graduated from Nazarbayev University this year. So uh, let's get started. As you know, in March 22nd of this year, Microsoft released GitHub Copilot X in preview mode. And one of its uh, uh, greatest features is that it's powered by ChatGPT4. And just before we dive into the presentation, I want to share some quick steps to play with the future versions of Copilot and experimental versions of maybe other plugins and Visual Studio Code as well. And so to play with Copilot, you need to request pre-release version on GitHub promotional website. After that, you need to install VS Code Insiders, which is uh, on the right side. It has green color. So it's basically the same VS Code, but uh, with all new experimental features. And yeah, you just install plugin for Copilot, uh, activate pre-release version, and you need to finally wait for GitHub's approval. And uh, short disclaimer, unfortunately, I was not able to play with Copilot uh, uh, in VS Code, but I've prepared good examples, so you would uh, have a good understanding of that. And these examples are on Python. Yeah, also, unfortunately. But I think you catch up the main idea of Copilot. So now let's uh, get started with Copilot features. Uh, first feature is integrated chat window. It can do a bunch of stuff for you. For instance, explain code segments, write or refactor unit tests, find bugs, and in much greater level than the previous Copilot version. So uh, let us quickly uh, evaluate the, the next example. So imagine you have this snippet of code and we have two regular expressions, uh, some function, uh, which basically uses it. And uh, imagine that uh, someone else uh, written this code, and now you need to understand uh, the sense of this code. So in order to uh, ask Copilot to explain it for you, you need just to highlight these lines that you're interested in. Uh, then you are writing the prompt, explain this regular expression, and finally you get this result. And as you can see, uh, this regular expression is written in Python, it's used to match email addresses, and uh, Copilot would provide much more specific details in the next uh, lines, evaluating like pieces by pieces. And another great feature is writing unit tests. So similarly, uh, we have the following function. Uh, so basically in this function, we have a string of records that are separated by the lines. And you are, we are having the string as an input parameter in our function, and we have an array of uh, objects, objects, which we'll call expenses. So we are just iterating it, splitting all these uh, three values like date, value, and currency uh, separately, and put inside our array. And now imagine that you want to write unit tests for these functions. As well, you are just uh, writing the request for the chat. So write a set of unit test functions for selected code and uh, you'll get such result. So it uh, handles three different cases in which we have valid input, in which we have empty input, and finally input with comments so that it would disregard the comments. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, everything looks uh, like here as a whole. So it, I think, would be really uh, 
comfortable and convenient for developers to work with Copilot X. And uh, let's quickly discover some differences between ChatGPT window and Copilot. Uh, first of all, it's integrated into VS Code. You would no longer need to switch between your browser and uh, your uh, code editor. Uh, finally, uh, secondly, uh, Copilot X is heavily trained on GitHub repositories, different libraries. Uh, thirdly, it has a great context awareness of your whole code base. It uh, indexes and analyzes like who your code base and generates suggestions in much more consistent way and in much more insightful way than ChatGPT. So the second uh, feature of Copilot X is tailored docs or personalized docs. So basically uh, when we are writing the code, sometimes we want to dive into the, the official documentations to uh, get kind of full information about the things uh, that you want to know more. Like for instance, in this example, we want to vertically center a div. And now you can write for a uh, copilot uh, this kind of requests and it will uh, analyze all existing documentations and kind of get juices from them and uh, put uh, into your table so that you get most relevant information and do not waste time while surfing on the full uh, kind of whole documentations. Uh, the third feature is voice coding. So uh, here are some images like import pandas and uh, Copilot would automatically generate the code for you. So you just name or say the instructions it will generate along the way. Along the way. So for instance, you are saying get Titanium CSV data from the verb and you got this result in the first line. So yeah, this is, I think, pretty powerful tool that will keep programmers more extroverted, but I'm even, I'm not quite sure of whether it would be used, it would be a popular feature among developers. However, I believe that this feature has a great potential to serve us as a pair programming assistant. Yeah, so this is like uh, another visual, visualization. Uh, the next uh, feature is optimized pull requests. As you know, Copilot X is uh, linked with our GitHub. And uh, whenever we are now opening the pull requests, it will um, analyze all the changes that you've made to the code base and uh, generate the insightful description for you. So in this example, as you can see, when we pushed awesome feature, uh, branch into the repository. Uh, the copilot generated this description for us. Uh, here we can see the generalized kind of a short description for that, what it done and also uh, uh, specific details about uh, the work that has been done over the code. And as you can see, uh, this Explanations are, I think, really helpful for other developers uh, to understand. Yeah, and when you see the changes that your teammates uh, made to the code base, now it would be much more easier uh, to like track, keep track of those updates. And instead of reaching them out and asking to explain it to you, now you just can uh, browse uh, those explanations in, in, in pull requests. Yeah, and those also pull requests would be marked as generated by Copilot so that you can see that this was, was uh, automatically generated. And uh, final feature is uh, Common Line Interface Assistant. I think, yeah, it's one of the greatest uh, uh, innovations that have been proposed by Microsoft and Copilot. So as we know, when we are working with different CLI libraries, it's very difficult to work with different commands, with different instructions, uh, to keep in mind the correct flags and pass the correct arguments. And uh, Copilot uh, now is uh, solving this issue for us. So uh, in order to perform some job, some uh, name, some instructions, and 
you just need to uh, write the following. You just add your sentence with two question marks and uh, uh, kind of uh, explaining with, you need to explain with your own words what, what you intend to achieve. And for instance, in this case, we want to use FFMPG library to add a watermark, watermark um, la layer to our video. And as we do not uh, aware of this library and how it works, we just write Copilot to do this work for us. And finally, we get this command with a correct set of instructions. And also, we will get the full explanation of each flag and uh, argument and what they are actually doing. And even if the copilot would be wrong with this command, you may analyze it by yourself and correct it where it's possible. So yeah, I think this is very great technique, a great uh, feature. And uh, just before completing my presentation, I wanted to also share a quick disclaimer. So uh, you need to use Copilot X for uh, commercial projects uh, with managerial approval. And using it without any authorization may inadvert advertently expose your source code. So uh, Copilot X Copilot is available in, with two subscription models. First, it's individual and it would be red flag to use individual subscription for commercial projects because um, uh, GitHub may uh, use these snippets of code for analyzing or improving the Copilot X. So they would be kind of stored somewhere in the internet. And uh, enterprise version. Uh, Microsoft claims that uh, for uh, enterprise copilot version, they do not store the code anywhere. But even uh, with this claim, you need uh, to talk with your managers if you want to use uh, Copilot X Assistant. So yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, with this link, you may uh, join the wait lists for Copilot X for its different features and get uh, more information about Copilot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gijan. Uh, again, it was a really great presentation, and I hope that everyone will at least try this new functionality, but of course not in the commercial projects, because as we know, really, with the great power, we have the great responsibility. So yeah, actually, it was our last technical talk, mm -hmm. so I think we can call it a day. So thanks a lot for, for you, our listeners, for joining us. And so let's just move on.